Hello, welcome, welcome everybody um, for this um, afternoon webinar. Um, first, just to say that um, the webinar will be recorded, uh, which we will um, send a link to you afterward, so you can um, look at the presentation afterward or pass it to other people if you want. Um, so the presentation is organized by Institution of Mechanical Engineer, uh, Birmingham Area Committee. And today we have the privilege to get um, Helen Shaw um, with us to talk to us about how to and how to MMB uh, manage environmental risk in design and build con contracts. So Helen is a um, is the environmental lead for um, a major engine consulting company called Mo McDonald. Before I pass the time to Helen, just a few things uh, um, to, and housekeeping. Um, today, uh, presentation will be uh, around uh, 20 minutes each. Uh, and then afterward, we will give you some time to um, answer your questions. Um, so if you do have any questions, then on the right hand side, there should be a box you can put in, um, ask a question. So feel free to put in any questions uh, and then um, we will try our best to answer as many as possible at the end. Um, so, um, yep, that's about it. Can I pass the time to Helen? Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you're all keeping well. My name is Helen Lyshen, and I am the environmental lead for Mock McDonnell Bentley. And today I'd like to talk to you about how we manage environmental risks in design and build contracts in the water industry. I'm going to begin by introducing Mock McDonnell Bentley as a company, as well as my role in the business as an environmental lead. I will talk about the many ways in which we can interface with the environment, as well as the many links I have across the business. In the second half of the presentation, I will discuss a case study to demonstrate how MMB integrate the management of environmental risks into project work. I will conclude by talking about lessons learned from the case study and any aspects we take forward to manage in all of the projects we work on. And of course, at the end, there'll be some time for questions. So first of all, who are MMB? So MMB is a joint venture between Mott McDonald, a global engineering consultancy, and JNB, a British construction company. We are a fully integrated design and build contractor, providing an end-to-end -end service for our clients. We are one of the largest design and build contractors in the water industry today, currently delivering services for six water companies and about to start working with the seventh. So I'm based along with Larry in Shifnal in Telford, where we work with our client Seven Trent Water to deliver innovative solutions within both the clean and wastewater industry. As design and build contractors, we help identify the solution, identi under <laughs> undertake the design, sorry, and build the new asset. Projects we work on may include drilling new abstraction boreholes, building new service reservoirs, installing cross-country pipelines, upgrading existing sewage and water treatment facilities and restoring rivers. So why am I here? Why is environmental management so critical to our business? Well, firstly, there's legal compliance. Working in sensitive environmental settings, close to protected species sometimes, managing waste and undertaking potentially harmful activities are all subject to regulation. To protect our business, we must understand how to comply legally and obtain the correct permissions from the appropriate regulators. Failure to comply can lead to significant fines and even jail sentences. Obtaining these permissions themselves can take time, require survey data, and have associated costs, of course. And a big part of my job is managing permitting and consent to protect the business and our operational staff. Secondly, we need to manage environmental risk as we've got a moral obligation to ensure our projects do not cause harm. And this takes us on to the third point, as failure to protect the environment or causing a pollution incident will, of course, adversely impact our reputation with the client, stakeholders and members of the public. Finally, there, we've got client goals. The water companies, for example, plan to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030, and Seven Trent Water have additional goals around biodiversity net gain. As tier one contractors, we need to evolve to ensure that we help our clients achieve their targets. For those of you who don't work in an environmental role, it's quite easy sometimes to underestimate the wide range of aspects 
projects that our job encompasses. And I've listed here just some of the more common areas that we get involved in. From developing strategies to improve sustainability, to planning and undertaking ecological surveys, from reviewing contaminated land data, to checking waste returns, from developing risk assessments for permit applications, identifying new innovative products to help us manage pollution risks on our construction sites. The role is hugely diverse, fast-paced and unpredictable. Fundamentally, our business involves building things, and as a result, there's potential for us to have negative impact on the environment. For example, through habitat loss, pollution to water, land and air, noise and vibration, disturbance to archaeological assets, exacerbating flood risk, and impacting upon community and visual aesthetics of an area. The list goes on. Alongside risks, there are numerous opportunities to be discovered and implemented with regard to the environment. For example, habitat creation, engaging with our communities, and improving carbon management and water quality. A large part of the role is to identify risks on the project by project basis and to ensure that impact is minimal and opportunities are realised. Okay, so how do we do this? How, in, in my day-to-day -day job, how do we manage the management of environmental risks and opportunities? So my team and I get involved in projects early and work collaborative, co collaboratively, if I can talk, with our design engineers, clients, feasibility consultants, and regulatory stakeholders where applicable. Our approach to environmental risk management comprises a high-level review at programme level, followed by active management of an internal tool we call the QES workbook, in which quality, environmental and safety risks are captured. I meet with the project managers to discuss and record environmental aspects and impacts for a given project and confirm the next steps. This might include the production of specialist environmental reports, survey work, or the procurement of licences or consents. I also work closely with our land and planning consultants and input into the environmental management plans where necessary. Prior to construction, we ensure that all residual risks are communicated to site. Moreover, we undertake environmental audits and, um, and offer support to our site teams with regard to mitigation, pollution prevention and legal compliance. In addition to our work with design and construction teams, we work alongside other environmental professionals across the MMB regions in leading initiatives to promote environmental and sustainable atti attitudes throughout the company. I sit on our clients' environmental forum and attend environmental, external environmental networking groups to ensure we are kept up to date with current legislation and innovation. Okay, so to demonstrate to you all how this works in real life, I'm now going to talk about a project we have recently finished called Cowley Distribution Service Reservoir and Lower Witch Pipeline, located near Malvern in Worcestershire. The project ran from 2016 to 2019 and was required to improve resilience in Malvern, maintain efficiency and increase network capacity to account for future population growth. The solution was to build a new treated water reservoir at an existing Cowley DSR site. And for anyone who's not aware, a DSR is essentially an underground concrete structure designed to store water. In addition, a pipeline was planned from Cowley to Lower Witch through Malvern to distribute the additional water supply. And you can see the route is shown there indicatively on the map. Hopefully you can just about make that out. As with all the projects we work on, environmental risks associated with Cowley and Lower Witch were identified during design, which consisted of a high level review and use of the QES workbook. The first risk we identified was that the site was located on the edge of an area of outstanding natural beauty. This meant our construction work could have had an impact on the aesthetics of the surrounding environment and, and the designation itself could have been at risk. The site was partially surrounded by a species-rich hedgerow, providing habitat for dormice and nesting birds. The hedgerow itself was considered important under the hedgerow regs due to its age and relevance to the surrounding landscape. There was an ordinary watercourse near the site, which needed protection from pollution during construction. 
the access to Cowley DSR was part of the Shropshire Way public right of way and as such impact to the public using that track had to be considered. The pipeline element of the job had to um, cross through the centre of Malvern, which is a busy historical town and a tourist hub. Lots of businesses there as well. Key stakeholder management included interfaces with the residents and local business owners and the Malvern Hills conservators. However, there's also a great deal of opportunity on this job, including the reuse of ASDEG material and the earthwork design on site, plus active recycling of skip waste. We were able to enhance the reputation of MMB and the client through positive engagement with the public during the pipeline element of the job. Replanting was undertaken on site to replace what was removed prior to construction and dormice boxes were installed in the woodland adjacent to the works. We worked closely with the design engineers to ensure decision making on the project incorporated these environmental risks and opportunities. Following the identification of the risks, we then needed to plan to protect this project from these risks causing delays to the programme. Further to this, we also needed to ensure mitigation was in place to prevent our project from causing harm. The scale of the project triggered the requirement for an EIA screening, that's Environmental Impact Assessment. To supplement the EIA screening, we undertook various surveys, including ecological phase one assessments, flood risk assessments, an archaeological report was done, and also an, an environmental management plan. And by demonstrating to the local planning officer that we had a robust plan in place to prevent harm to the environment, we were able to screen out a full EIA, which would have been detrimental to our programme if we'd had to do it. Planning permission was needed, however, and was successfully obtained early in 2016, aided by the environmental deliverables I've described. Mitigation included planning and ecological supervision to remove the hedgerow, replanting where we could around the perimeter of the new, new asset, and installing some dormice boxes in the adjacent woodland to compensate for habitat loss. We liaised with the Malvern Hills District Council regarding the public right of way and the route of the pipeline. Signage was put in place and the footpath was kept open during the construction phase to ensure that the users of the right of way could still benefit from the amenity value of the Shropshire Way whilst we were building close to it. We worked closely with the landscape team at the AONB to, finish, to plan the finish of the DSR to ensure that the completed asset would not have a detrimental impact on the aesthetics of the local area. Water companies, you may know, prefer the finish of the roofs of their built reservoir or buried reservoirs to be stone. So we worked closely with the colourists in the AONB to ensure that the stone we picked complemented the environmental setting. Finally, the environmental management plan was used to highlight solutions to potential pollution risks and nuisance, including noise, vibration and dust that could have been produced during the construction phase. Once the design was in place, the really exciting bit started as we took the project to site in July 2016. Here, the benefit of our work in design came to, to fruition as we checked our site activities against the environmental management plan to ensure compliance. My involvement on the job was slightly different from this point on, so rather than planning and mitigation, my role was to undertake regular environmental audits on the site and support our operational team. A key part of this was pollution prevention and checking that the site team were incorporating this into their work. I always ask my teams to think about pollution sources, pathways and receptors. So what could go wrong or cause harm or disturbance? What or who could be impacted? And what are we going to do to stop it? For example, on this project, we had a large stockpile of spoil stored temporarily. This is a potential source of pollution should that get washed into a watercourse or, or so forth. The receptor in this case is a ditch on the site boundary and the pathway could be overland flow and heavy rain events. To break this chain, salt fencing was installed around the base of the stockpile. By considering the source pathway receptor model, it's really simple to plan in mitigation. As well as pollution, I audit waste management, how we're storing waste and how we are meeting our duty of care with regard to taking waste off site. I check in with our near miss reporting. All our teams are encouraged to report environmental near misses to give us opportunities to learn, improve and drive new initiatives. I check in with how we're managing ecological risks and invasive species if we've got any present. And finally, I check for any sustainable innovations on site or look for any opportunities to engage better with the local community. 
Okay, I'm now going to show you, hopefully if technology's on our side, a quick video taken by a drone during the construction phase at Cowley. So I'm hoping if I just, hopefully this is going to play. Double click. Uh, I knew technology was going to let us down at the 11th hour. <laughs> Bear with me, folks. Double click on slide. Okay, so we got there in the end. I hope you've enjoyed that. Okay, now you can see the finished project across the two slides. Um, so on the left, we've got the original asset. You can just see it's buried. And then to the, in the photo on the right, you can see the new asset we've built just to the left of the original. So that was our project. We've taken a lot of positive learning from the Cowley and Lower Witch project with regard to holistic environmental planning. Firstly, the design and construction team worked together closely, collaboratively, throughout all phases of the project to ensure that the construction processes were fully understood, environmental risks identified, and appropriate mitigation was incorporated into the project programme. Furthermore, through multidisciplinary workshops, for example, ecologists, archaeologists, landscape architects, and environmental specialists working together, our approach to risk management has been holistic and streamlined. Secondly, through liaison with relevant stakeholders and our clients, customers, early on in the project life, we were able to ensure our disruption to local communities was minimised. And you can see in that photo, one of our gangs from construction, I mean, given a cake made by one of our local business owners who was thrilled with how we really minimise disruption when we were building just outside her shop in the road to put in the new pipeline. The project has also demonstrated how simple wins for biodiversity can be easily incorporated into projects. Here, the simple installation of dormouse boxes has led to a net gain in habitat value on the site. And finally, this project has showcased that if you involve environmental specialists throughout the project, you will get greater gains in terms of management at the end. Now, I originally prepared a variation of this presentation to a local environmental networking group here in, Sh in Shropshire. And they hosted an event on environmental planning with this tagline in green text at the bottom of the slide. While development is key to sustained economic growth, so too is the maintenance of our environment. And that quote really resonated with us in MMB, as we felt that sometimes the construction industry can get a bit of a bad press, as traditionally environmental management is not always at the forefront of the industry. However, we understand that development is integral to economic growth and is going to happen with or without environmental specialists involved. And we feel thrilled to be part of a construction company that puts planning for the environment at the heart of business operations. Any questions? Thank you, Helen. So if any of you do have any questions, do um, put your question in the box on the right hand side and uh, ask a question. Um, so um, while you guys um, try to put in question, um, maybe I can ask Helen one or two questions. So I just want to ask you, um, what sort of um, most common, common mistake 
um, either the design team or the uh, or the construction team make, which at the end will cause environmental incidents, like for example flooding or contamination or pollution, those sort of things. And then at the end, maybe you can talk about what sort of what sort of consequences for for us as a company as well, maybe. Sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, um, I don't want to single anyone out, so I'll do design and construction then for things that maybe haven't gone to plan. I think firstly in design, I think a common misconception is that sometimes design engineers don't anticipate a permit or consent or license isn't needed because it's only a little bit of a hedgerow we're taking out or only quite a small ditch or stream we're culverting through to, to improve access or whatever. So we don't really need to have permission. But to be very clear, um, particularly if we're working near water, if we're doing any work in channel, permission from a, the local authority will be needed um, and just because you're going to be in and out doing that bit of site work in a week doesn't mean you don't need to have permission and it would be a legal breach if we failed to get that bit of paper in place and we have had incident instance too strong word but instances when we've got to site and we don't have that bit of paper and we've had to rejig programs in order to get the appropriate permission in place and as we all know you start to rejig programs and, and uh, uh, restructure how we deliver a project that's when the, the money starts to uh, um, roll, roll on really so um, I think that'd be my big learning for design teams. Um, I think in terms of site teams um, I think we always start on site with really really good intentions we have still fencing in place we're monitoring our eco ecological risks we're doing our toolbox talks and I think as, as time and money presses on and we're 18 months into a program and we're running and running to try and deliver a project successfully with all the other pressures on us, things start to lapse a little bit. So I think the learning for site teams would be uh, just ensure that environment is front and centre of our, of our weekly, monthly, quarterly progress meetings. It's discussed in meetings with our design team and our client and it's front and centre of our decision making always, not just when we arrive on site because again our legal breaches will, uh, will creep in to play if we are, are failing to, to uh, manage an aspect that we've got a consent for or we take it off the ball and cause a pollution incident for example so I think that would be biggest lessons learned for, for those two. Okay thank you Helen. Um, I, I have one or two more questions um, I could ask you but um, one of our listeners um, have a question say thank you for the presentation Helen. Yeah I thank you Helen as well for that. Uh, can you please give a small description of how you log or discuss um, learning activities and does this take place during or after the projects? Oh, so how, how we learn from projects, is that, is that the question? I, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Okay. Where, whether you, I suppose it's whether you, 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 you keep continuing learning or do you just do the learning afterwards? Um, I'm going to say continual learning <laughs> generally. Mm. Um, I, I think I do. I do have quite a presence on our construction sites. So I go out minimum every three months to all our sites. And um, I, I think the, the main conduits for us to um, feedback good or not so good work on site or through design is in morning briefings on site or um, RAMS reviews when we might, uh, so for example, if we had a, a bad near miss and we almost got some silt into a water course, we had some spoils stored, a big rain event came, our silt fencing wasn't really up to scratch and, and we nearly we nearly released some silt into water course as an example, then the, the learning there would be to um, review the RAMs and update them so the site teams understand what the next steps and improvements mm -hmm. that need to be made are. Um, and it might be attending site and having a stand down with the site teams to talk about that. Uh, I think in terms of more the design side of it, myself and my team here in Schiffnell spend quite a lot of time reviewing audit data, near miss data, things we see out and about on site and developing new ish uh, initiatives, developing new guidance notes and um, we've actually written for in the last oh, 18 months we've written five company environmental standards. So it's continu continually writing these guidance notes, updating them and sharing them with the design teams to make sure that we are continually learning. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you, Helen. I, I mean, what I will add is um, kind of similar to health and safety, um, where we will have some uh, lean misreporting. Uh, similarly, in environmental, in MMB, we do have something called uh, lean misreporting for environmental incident as well. So basically, the, the, the idea is that um, um, some are, or, uh, other projects or other, in, in fact, other office could also learn from the incident as well. And 
um, so everybody can learn and prevent anything happening again, anything similar to happen again. Um, Sometimes um, the result or the incident could be um, uh, uh, um, kind of pointing to um, certain condition or certain way we do things and causing that incident. So maybe it's the methodology causing problem. So if that's the case, then um, if we actually learn um, as we go along, as we co as the project continue, then we can actually take immediate action as well, so that um, um, to minimize any uh, similar incident from happening again uh, in other projects. So um, yeah, as Helen said, I would say that is kind of a continuous learning process, really. Hope that answers your question. Uh, somebody have another question. Um, so, um, do you work with standard guidelines or design principle or checklist? to make sure you take all aspects of the project into account and anticipate issue as early as uh, design stage. I mean, actually, that's kind of similar to one of the questions I was going to ask uh, is um, kind of, uh, as for the project team, how soon or how early should they actually get you involved? Oh, that's a great question about the construction teams. Um, I'll, I'll do that part of the question first. Um, as soon as possible. <laughs> 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 that's a really cheap answer probably but as soon as, as, soon as you, you know you're going to, who your site team are going to be who your delivery manager is going to be get them involved and I'd even go as far as to say if you don't have a designated site agent on your project yet it might even be useful to talk to a another site agent delivery manager in your business who might be able to give you a bit of a steer on how you do a certain activity, how much space you need to do a certain activity, um, and, and to start using the amazing wealth of knowledge that comes from operational teams. Um, another learning I suppose I've got over the course of my career is that sometimes you, you walk up to a, a site to do an, an audit and whilst we thought we'd be working, I don't know, 20 metres away from a massive old oak tree, actually now we're seven meters away, infringing on that really important protected root zone. And actually, how are we going to build the thing is becoming far more complicated. So I think we need to be engaging with our operational teams very early on, as, as soon as you can get anybody involved, because they will add so much value with regard to how we build stuff and how much space we need. And uh, I, I think as well, in terms of, for, for me, thinking about waste, we always it feels like we end up with more waste spoil than we thought we were going to. I don't know what that's just there. Um, so I think, again, it's, it's worth speaking to the operational team and try and get a real feel if we're digging in clay or sand or, or gravels, what might we be getting out of the ground and what can we do with it? So that's a bit on, on um, construction teams. The bit about checklists, yes, I mean, obviously we, we use, um, follow the follow legal compliance in terms of ecology, making sure we have licenses in place, working near water, licenses in place. Um, Natural England, EA, local authorities will have their own standards that we follow, but to simplify life, they are integrated into our own QES system here in MMB. So the checklist I touched on very, very lightly in the presentation, the QES checklist, will pick out various aspects of environmental management, archaeology, landscape, designated sites, whatever. Um, and asks questions to the design team based on the, the British standards, if you like. So um, that's all wrapped up early on. And then that's a working document that lasts until we get to site. So I hope that answers that. Yes, sorry, I, I forgot to um, uh, post a question to Puppet so people can let me do that first before I continue. Um, so um, at the end of that question, I mean, Am I right to say um, different local council, they have slightly different requirements? So make your life slightly more difficult, isn't it? Yes, it, it can be. Um, so local authority, thinking that the easy one to talk about now would be working in ordinary water courses. So an ordinary water course is a smaller minor channel that is um, maybe a, a tributary to a, to a main river or even a smaller ditch or, or land drain and local authorities are the regulator for that. And there are a list of 
criteria that will trigger the need to have consent if we wanted to dig through it. But certain activities, for example, are exempt. So if you were to drill a or, or place a pipe under an ordinary water course, you would not need consent. But if you're going to open cut through the ditch, you would. Um, so subtle, subtle differences. Um, or if you're putting a head wall on, you, you, you probably would. But if you weren't, if you were um, building it offline, as it were, you wouldn't. And um, sometimes that the can be um, a certain amount of subjectivity with regard to if consent is needed or not and yeah I suppose that can differ as you talk to different teams I, I think that goes for for many things really but ge generally I think my advice would be with regard to working local authorities and the EA and the other major regulators is just try and talk to them early because first of all you might be trying to get a consent when it's not needed. You might be able to find a better solution by talking to them. And secondly, if they know what your project looks like before the application lands on their desk, from experience, it tends to go through the approval process far quicker. You tend to get the outcome you like. So I'm a big fan of inviting our regulators out onto site to meet us to talk through what we're building, where, how we're going to build it, when we're building it. And if there are any little wrinkles in the design or some things which might... Um, uh, cause a sticking point in the application, shall we say, we can iron it out before the application gets to their desk. So that's another bit of learning. Okay, thank you, Helen. Um, the next question, I think, is from your um, fellow environmental um, um, professionals. Um, the question is, um, do you do um, EIA in-house or uh, do you subcontract that out? I think I know the question, but I'll let you answer it. <laughs> yeah, so good question. Um, so the um, the EIA screening that we did for Cowley, the reports were written by ourselves and MMB. We've got a large team of, of uh, environmental resources in the wider Mott McDonald world, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so we wrote the reporting. In that instance, it was coordinated by our land and planning consultants as they are employed directly by our client. Although I know in other regions where MMB operates, so Welsh Water, for example, um, the client doesn't um, hire a separate land and planning consultant, so we do it all in-house. So it just so happens where we are in MMB, Seven Trent, uh, we've got a land and planning consultant to, to steer us through the process, but we work very closely with them. I was on the phone to one of our contacts just yesterday actually discuss the project, um, and it's a, it's a good relationship. Um, we work very closely together to make sure that we get the right outcome. So yes, so in answer to your question, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I suppose it depends, it depends, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the next question is quite interesting. Uh, it's from our, some of our colleagues from uh, Labour Wales, actually. Um, it's asked, um, well, thank you, Helen, and most interesting. Has your environmental information been used, changed the construction program orders or phase, um, for example, due to habitation, behaviour, water level, visitor number, etc., uh, which take priority with the client? Um, well, which of these take priority with the client and the completion date and the cause and or environment environment can't speak now. <laughs> Yes, that's a really great question. And, and yes, absolutely, it has. Um, sometimes it's a nice, easy one. We find a nesting bird and we have to put off clearance for um, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. So that's quite easy. We have had jobs where we've had to restructure the programme entirely. Working in River, for example, um, we couldn't work. I'm trying to think of a few jobs where we've been wanting to do some in-channel work, but we couldn't do it when salmon would be active. So we've had to reschedule. And in terms of the client, I mean, of, of course, I mean, there's always going to be a little bit of frustration when you have to feed back. We're going to have to change this. But I must say, we're really, really lucky here with our client. Uh, I think it probably helps working in the water industry when you've got a client who also has environmental management quite high on the agenda, to be honest, um, in that it can be frustrating, but it, it's never be, we've never been told kick on regardless, put it that way. Um, we've got a positive client who will work with us to make sure that we can do the right thing. Um, you know, sometimes we've had jobs, something about flood risk activity permits, for example, where we need to get a permit to work in the floodplain to put a pipeline in, and it, we just had to rejig the order, we put the pipe in the ground. So it's never been, I can't think of a job, maybe my, my man will tell me otherwise, but I can't think of a job where we've stopped, we've had to stop a job because of environmental constraints. But yes, there have been many times where we've had to rejig programs. As I came back to, I suppose, the original sentiment in my presentation, if we get in early and we plan, that shouldn't mm. happen. Um, so I suppose it, it shouldn't happen. If it does happen, we deal with it. And if we have to deal with it, the client, certainly our client, is always very positive. Mm. So we're pretty lucky. 
Yeah, I, I suppose that kind of emphasized one of the points Helen made earlier, which is um, to involve her team as soon as possible, because most of the time, um, many of those um, um, they can actually foresee um, could happen. Um, so if 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 the construction team actually uh, involve them earlier, then yeah, they can yeah, what they say will influence the program, but uh, uh, won't be um, as bad as late. Or if you do it the other way, where you actually have your program, but then later on, um, oh, I, let me ask ask the environmentalist whether anything. Then by that time, it will be more costly to change the program. Um, I think I have the end of the list of questions. Anybody still have question? I give you ten more seconds to ask any questions. Yeah, personal side is very interesting today presentation. Um, yeah, we we definitely. I I mean. I think the key thing is kind of communication is definitely important. So we, we definitely to um, not only communicate with the um, remote team in the office, but we also definitely to communicate with the client and the authority um, as well, so that we know what the requirement is, what sort of standard they're asking for, uh, and then we can minimize any interruption to the construction. Um, I don't have any more questions in. Helen, do you have, have any final word to add in? Uh, oh gosh, any final thoughts? Um, just that I really enjoyed talking to you all, to all today. I, I think I, I was slightly surprised when Larry asked me to speak to all you lovely people today, thinking, goodness me, mechanical engineers, what can I, what can I tell you guys about? But um, it's been a real pleasure. And actually, I think it's really, really useful to have some multidisciplinary um, webinars like this when we can learn what other people in our industry, in the wide industry are doing. So thank you. And um, I'll have to come to mechanical talk soon, I think, and, and learn a bit from what you guys do. <laughs> but thank yeah. you. It's been great. Yep, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for um, um, spending some time with us today. It's very, definitely very use, useful, informative and uh, interesting talk. Uh, and thank you all of you to attending to the presentation as well. Um, for the um, IMAE uh, Birmingham Area uh, Committee, we will have a um, Christmas virtual gathering uh, on the 22nd of December. So if you are in the area um, or if you belong to the um, BA. BAC area, then you should in, uh, receive an invitation um, email later on. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you all for coming uh, and goodbye.